everyone, welcome back to the Weekend Charts. Charlie Bellello here. As always, we're going to run through the most important charts and themes that we're seeing today in markets and investing. A lot to discuss. I want to start out with the housing market, purchasing power decline. Really a continuation of a theme we've been seeing for the past year, uh, but it's becoming more pronounced with mortgage rates continuing to move higher. So 7.23% now. 30 year fixed mortgage. That's the highest rate we've seen in over two decades. So many people are seeing these rates for the first time. They weren't around back then, at least in the home buying market back then. And so this is a real shock to them, particularly coming after uh, the lowest mortgage rates in history just a few years ago. So huge shift, 2.65% all the way up to 7.23%. And we're seeing this across the board, uh, conforming loans and jumbo loans. Uh, alike are seeing the highest mortgage rates we've seen in a long time. And the jumbo market is simply the higher dollar amount, so above $726,000. And we're seeing now higher jumbo rates than conforming, so 7.44 for jumbo. And this is kind of a flip of what we saw for a number of years, where jumbo's uh, loan rates were actually lower than conforming rates, where banks were fighting uh, each other to try to lure wealthy clients uh, with below market mortgage rates. These were clients expected to pay these loans back, obviously, uh, but it was like uh, viewed as an additional uh, benefit for customers that you would get these uh, premium mortgages and companies like Silicon Valley Bank and First Republic, among others, uh, were offering these uh, jumbo loans at uh, lower interest rates. Well, that seems to have uh, come to an end here and we're seeing Fewer banks doing things like this. JP, uh, JP Morgan, Jamie Dimon actually mentioned it after they purchased First Republic. He said, uh, we're not going to be putting a lot of cheap jumbo mortgage loans on our books. So very different market uh, today than just a few years ago and very different in terms of what uh, $3,000 monthly payment uh, can get you in terms of the house uh, that you can afford. So a uh, $3,000 payment back in early 2021 when mortgage rates were at record lows actually could have bought you a $640,000 house. And that includes property taxes and homeowners insurance. Today, if we look at that same $3,000 payment, you're talking about a $433,000 house, over $200,000 decline in the purchasing power for homeowners just based on that higher mortgage rate. And so unbelievable uh, shift here from ultra low interest rates uh, to uh, higher interest rates that we've seen in a number of decades. And as you might imagine, this shift in terms of affordability has led to a collapse in terms of uh, mortgage demand. So this is a, a look here at the MBA uh, purchase index. So purchase uh, mortgage purchase applications are at their lowest levels now since 1995. So a huge uh, decline here. And if you look at uh, over here in 2021, that huge spike uh, in mortgage applications with uh, mortgage rates hitting record lows. And, and since then, just a, a, a continued decline and here hitting lowest since 1995. So clearly uh, demand has collapsed in terms of the housing market. But the surprising thing is that has not led to lower prices. And the reason for that is supply has collapsed even more. So what we're seeing is a continuation uh, in terms of a decline in listings. Redfin uh, reports this data every month. And what they're seeing in uh, for the month of July was the lowest number of active listings on record. For They've been keeping records since 2012, lowest we've seen on record. So extremely low levels of supply. Uh, so that's counteracting that decline in demand. And when you combine very little demand with very little supply, what you get is very few transactions. And so we got this report of exist existing homes that we get every month, 17% decline from a year ago. That was the 23rd consecutive year of year decline. That was the longest streak that we've seen since 2007 to 2009. Now, if we compare the period today, with back then, housing bubble uh, back then, housing bubble today. Thus far, the big difference is that supply equation. And so unlike the period back then, we're not seeing uh, prices decline. 
we're actually seeing prices start to stabilize here and actually go up on a year over year basis. But if we're talking about the housing market in terms of existing homes and new homes, what we're seeing because of the uh, collapse in existing homes for sale is an increasing uh, share of the market for new homes. And for a few months, we saw home builders pretty excited about this and saying, we're going to start building more. That seems to have leveled off uh, a bit. We're not seeing housing uh, starts really accelerate uh, very much at all. We saw a little bit of a, a rise, but but not anything to speak of, certainly not enough uh, to change the supply demand dynamics. But we are seeing a bigger share of new homes. So if you're looking for a house to buy, uh, it's more likely to be a new home today than it's been uh, ever before. It was the highest rate, 31% of the market for the second quarter that we've seen uh, with data going back. So if we go back to existing homes, uh, what we have is people with mortgages at 4%, 3%, lower uh, and those people staying uh, in their homes uh, for the most part they're not putting their homes up for sale they're not wanting to move and lose that low mortgage rate and so what that's done to the supply uh, demand dynamic is caused a collapse in supply enough so that we're actually seeing higher prices now than a year ago not very not a huge jump two percent higher but pretty sh surprising when given that mortgage rates have uh, spiked, continue to spike over the last year. Uh, and we're actually seeing home prices higher than where they were a year ago. And this is a picture here showing you existing home prices over time. As you can see that huge spike higher uh, after the stimulus and after the money printing in 2020 and 2021. And initially we had uh, prices coming down in uh, 20, the back half of 2022. But uh, for the start of this year, we've seen home prices recover. And so where do we go from here? Obviously, a few possibilities. Uh, number one would be we, uh, we see more supply and prices come down, and that creates affordability, and that stimulates demand. Number two, we could see mortgage rates come back down. That could uh, entice uh, some more people, stimulate demand, help affordability. Or number three, it might just simply take time. If we have this standstill, uh, perhaps we're looking at prices the same a few years from now and people's incomes go up, there's more inflation, uh, and uh, maybe it'll simply uh, be a function of affordability will have to increase with time and with uh, people's wages. And so I have no prediction in terms of what will happen. I think the best case scenario would have been for home prices to normalize, not good to have a housing bubble it's not good to have these very low levels of affordability. It's not good to have low mobility. So now people are not leaving their homes. Perhaps they would have shifted and changed jobs, but now they're not doing so. Uh, and uh, that is, is not a good thing for an economy. You wanna have people uh, being able to move to different areas, uh, but we have this unique situation where mortgage rates rose so quickly in a very short period of time and it's creating the supply constraints. So we need more housing, we need more building. Uh, it doesn't seem like it's gonna come fast enough, but something will change uh, to change this dynamic. We just don't know what it will be. Certainly the employment market's going to be a big factor driving this as well. So if we were to see weakness in terms of the employment market, in terms of wage growth, uh, in terms of uh, unemployment rate, let's say it starts to go up, uh, well, I think that would have a big uh, impact on the housing market as well. So let's shift gears here, talk about uh, Disney, uh, getting some attention here because it's one of the few stocks, at least uh, major stocks that are not going up this year, but actually going down. Disney actually having its largest drawdown that we've seen in a long time, actually at 59% uh, lower now than its peak in March, 2021. So you're looking at a drawdown over two years, almost 60%. That's actually bigger than the drawdown it had during the global financial crisis, 56% back then, and it's actually longer in duration as well. So uh, pretty difficult times for Disney. What a shift uh, from what we saw uh, back in 2021 when it was roaring higher. We were talking at the time back then, I was trading at crazy valuation multiples and yeah, people getting super excited, even though the fundamentals uh, weren't looking that good for, for Disney. Uh, it was pretty much caught up in the mania. Well, very quickly, we're seeing the opposite uh, here 
uh, where uh, now people are very uh, down on the prospects for Disney valuation levels have come uh, come down significantly. But what's the real issue for for Disney? Well, it comes down to profitability. I talked about it last quarter, but uh, seeing a similar trend uh, for the second quarter, uh, what we see here is a profit margin picture that's very different uh, than what we saw uh, in recent years and a uh, pretty stark difference from what we saw in 2004. So I thought this was an interesting thing. So I highlighted here in a, in a tweet, but let's run through the numbers here. Back in 2004, revenues for Disney, this is 12 month revenues, 30 billion, and they had net profit of two and a quarter billion. And so put the two together, you got a net profit margin of 7.4%. Fast forward to today, you have revenues almost three times higher than that 2004 number, but the same exact net income. And so what we see here is a huge decline in the profit margin down to 2.6%. So Disney wants its share price to recover. It's going to have to do something to address this. It's going to have to make its divisions uh, more profitable. Uh, they could do that by cutting costs. That would be the easiest way. And they've already outlined uh, that they're going to try to do that. Uh, they're probably going to have to say that they're going to do that more aggressively, uh, or they're going to have to uh, raise prices uh, and achieve uh, achieve uh, higher margins that way. But a uh, different company uh, than certainly it was uh, with a higher private profit margin. So until it kind of rectifies this, it's not going to have the same uh, valuation multiples that it's had in the past. So let's talk about the Fed. Uh, Jackson Hole, they meet every year and uh, Powell had some interesting comments. Not anything different than what he's uh, been saying, but it's funny because every time he says it, uh, the market seems to be surprised by it. Uh, and what he said was essentially what he said at the last FOMC meeting saying that, yes, inflation's come down, but it's still too high and they're prepared to raise rates further if appropriate. And so will it be appropriate? We don't know yet, but I think the important point here is they're considering it. Uh, they may not be done. Uh, and the second point would be that they're uh, saying that they're going to uh, hold these policy rates at a restrictive level until they're confident that inflation is moving sustainably down towards our objective. And what's their objective? A 2% number. Why 2%, not 3% or 1%? Who knows? But that's the number they put out, 2%. Uh, and we're still above 3%. So we're not there yet. And as we talked about, uh, the CPI is likely to move higher again. Uh, when we get that August number. So we're not going to get there for August, but what is the Fed going to do at the next meeting, the September meeting? They're likely to hold. Uh, so the market is saying no change for September, but they're saying an increasing chance now above 50% that we're going to get a hike at the November meeting. So uh, that would push the Fed funds rate up to 550 to 575. Is that a done deal? No, definitely not. A lot of data points between now and then. Fed could make a few comments at that September meeting to kind of change this expectation. They're going to uh, do their dot plots again at the September meeting. So all of that is going to change expectations for November and December and beyond. But I think the important point coming from Powell's statements and what the market's reaction is, is that higher for longer is, uh, is what the market's expecting. And every step of the way, the market has underestimated the Fed's resolve in terms of hiking rates, how high, high they would hike, how fast they would hike, and how long uh, they're willing to keep rates at an elevated level. So uh, for now, Fed is much more serious about fighting inflation than the market has given them credit for. And so uh, this, the one fact uh, that I can tell you about this chart is it's going to change a lot. Uh, in the next few months, it always does based on any number of factors. But for now, markets thinking uh, that the Fed could hike uh, once again, but bigger picture, uh, they're going to stay higher for longer. And what that is doing to treasury yields is giving them a continued boost here. Three month uh, treasury uh, bill yield up to 5.61%. So starting to kind of price in that next rate hike, uh, not uh, there quite, uh, quite yet, but uh, getting there in terms of pricing that in and good news for anybody who has uh, cash savings, uh, money market funds, money market accounts, savings accounts, highest yields that you've uh, been able to get since 2001. Let's talk about NVIDIA. We got a huge earnings report there. Expectations were high. Uh, they beat kind of the stated expectations, uh, but 
uh, it's just unfathomable how quickly this company has grown over the past year, exceeding kind of any expectation based on uh, what people were thinking. And uh, it's been rewarded, obviously. The share price has tripled already this year. The stock I think, you know, it was kind of flat after earnings uh, the next trading day, but uh, it's already tripled on the year. But in terms of the numbers, just really incredible, incredible growth. And again, this was expected, but came in even higher than expected. It had revenues moving up to $13.5 billion in the second quarter, which was more than double uh, the year ago quarter. Uh, and the projection, more importantly, for the third quarter, $16 billion. So very rapid growth. That would be 170% increase on a year over year basis. And Jensen Huang, NVIDIA founder, CEO, saying a new computing era has begun. And no question uh, that's the case. The question is uh, how much uh, investors are already uh, paying for that in terms of NVIDIA's multiple. So before we get to that, let's talk about profitability because it's not just revenue story here. Uh, NVIDIA is making a huge net income now, over $6 billion, which was nine times higher than a year ago. Just uh, an unbelievable increase. So profit margins uh, going up and going up despite the fact that revenues are exploding higher. They're able to not only maintain profit margins, but increasing it. So uh, huge demand for the chips and the fact that NVIDIA is one of the few companies that can uh, meet that demand. Uh, is leading to just uh, enormous pricing power. Uh, and NVIDIA can basically set the price for now and profit margins are very high. Now, in a competitive market, free market system, uh, this is a commoditized uh, pro uh, uh, product. It will be eventually, you'd expect competitors to come in and try to offer uh, same product at a lower price and these profit margins to come down. But for now, NVIDIA 90% plus share in the market uh, and they're looking to, to to increase this, it seems like, in the third quarter and perhaps beyond that. Now, NVIDIA is very unique in terms of uh, where it stands versus other big tech companies in terms of the growth rates. Uh, other big tech companies' growth rates have slowed in large part. Um, we're talking about 11% uh, for Amazon, 8% Microsoft, 7% Google, Netflix at 3 Apple actually down 1% year over year, AMD, NVIDIA's one of the major competitors actually down 18% year over year. So very different seeing NVIDIA with their revenues more than doubling over the last year. Uh, and that's being reflected in terms of valuation ratios. NVIDIA is uh, kind of by itself in terms of uh, big tech price to sales, 36 times sales here. And and we've talked about it before. I don't have to go into it too much again, but very few companies in history been this size and had a multiple this high and have been able to uh, produce a, a strong return for investors. Will NVIDIA be the first? Perhaps only time will tell, but expectations are very, very high. And to exceed those expectations, I think will be difficult. So it's kind of a game in the short run. These multiples can go higher. They can certainly, they're going to come down on their own. If NVIDIA's projections are for guidance, obviously are correct. They're going to fall on their own. The question is when that growth slows, are you going to see uh, investors very quickly uh, change uh, their sentiment and and put a much lower multiple on Nvidia uh, than it has uh, before that slowdown, and that will that that lead to problems for the stock price. But that isn't the stage we're in right now. We're still in growth mode, and it's a question now, a game of expectations, and can Nvidia continue to exceed those very high expectations? Let's talk about the car market, and this is good news on the inflation front. Talked about Mannheim, which is the wholesale uh, used car index, showing a, a, a decline, and uh, that is a leading indicator for retail prices. Well, we're seeing the retail used car uh, market come down third month in a row. Good news. Hopefully, this continues, and uh, this is kind of the average of all used cars, but if we dig into Tesla, it's just been the declines have been way more pronounced and uh, what we've seen for the average use uh, price of a tesla is now twenty six thousand dollars lower than the peak a little over a year ago so just enormous uh, and part of that is price cuts the other part is a change in the mix where tesla has uh, more models at a lower price point but uh, all-time low in terms of the average price of a used tesla and this is 
clearly something Tesla wants and is engineering. They're saying they want to gain market share. They want to increase production. They want to get as many Teslas on the road as possible. Uh, but as we talked about in terms of earnings the last few quarters, this is uh, hitting margins, these lower price points uh, in terms of, of sales, although not as um, profitable uh, for Tesla. In the short run, they're willing to sacrifice that profitability in order to gain uh, market share. Now, what's causing problems for the car market? Well, it's the fact that most cars are financed. If we look at new vehicles, it's over 80% for used vehicles. It's a pretty high percentage as well. If you look at average auto loan rates for used uh, cars, you're at uh, 11% on average. Uh, and uh, that varies from state to state. Some are higher, some are lower, uh, but clearly at 11%, uh, putting pressure on the used car market. And that certainly could be impacting demand, even though supply is still an issue there. Uh, that's uh, impacting demand enough where we're seeing uh, prices starting to come down and hopefully uh, they will continue to come down. Now, so in that next inflation report, I think the used car will still be a factor uh, in terms of uh, bringing a CPI uh, at a lower number, but the other factor in terms of commodity prices is likely to lead to a higher CPI for August than we saw in July. So July was 3.2%. We're thinking in August, this is the Cleveland Fed is saying it's going to jump up to 3.8% on a year over year basis. So uh, corp CPI is still likely to come down, housing being the, the big driver of that. Uh, but if, if the Fed is looking at 2% as its target, they're certainly not going to be confident if they see inflation moving up to 3.8% in August. So we have enough data points here to say that the Fed will pause for the month of September but November will likely be dependent on what we see in terms of the inflation picture, uh, not just for August, but for September and October as well. So interesting thing in the equity market is uh, the fact that there's uh, cycles that exist and these cycles can last for much longer than people expect. I think the one of the biggest ones we've talked about value and growth, but the other big one is obviously looking at U.S. versus international and just an unbelievably long cycle of outperformance for U.S. stocks. So here's a chart showing you the last 15 years for the U.S. stock market, looking at the S&P 500 versus the MSCI World XUS and MSCI Emerging Markets. And what we see here is 360% plus gain for the S&P 500 versus 58% MSCI World XUS and 33% for the emerging markets. And if we break that down to an annualized percentage gain, just an enormous difference. So you got over 10% annualized returns for US stocks at the same time that the world, if we take the US out of it, is at 3% annualized and uh, emerging markets at a little under 2% annualized. So a very good year, a 15 year period for the US, but not certainly not extreme in terms of historically, uh, U.S. equities have done about 10% a year, so not anything extreme in the last 15 years, but what really stands out is that underperformance from international and emerging markets. So uh, what will the next 15 years uh, bring? Nobody knows, which is why diversification still is important. If you put everything in the U.S. stock market, uh, maybe it does well in the next 15 years. Hopefully it does well. Uh, but what if you have the situation where this is reversed in the next 15 years? Well, then you'd be happy uh, that you had some exposure outside of the U.S. So more than anything else, diversification is a risk management uh, strategy, a risk management uh, pr principle. It's protecting you against that inability to predict the future. And certainly predicting the next 15 years is not going to be easy. Uh, and certainly the expectation today is that the US stocks will continue to outperform. And that certainly might be the case, but because of that expectation, US stocks are valued at much higher levels than international or emerging markets. So uh, will that matter over the next 15 years? I don't know, but I suspect that uh, even if US stocks outperform in the next 15 years, it won't be uh, by this wide of a margin. And you can certainly see the reverse happening. I wouldn't be surprised. Uh, by either outcome. So let's talk about mania here on the other side. And I'd like to highlight this because it gets very little attention on the way down. 
Uh, the mini on the way up is always a big focus and people are talking about the riches that everyone's uh, making uh, in these crazy speculative uh, stocks. And the meme stop, uh, stock mania of early 2021 was like nothing really I've ever seen before. It was reminiscent only of, let's say the dot-com bubble, the last stages of the dot-com bubble in 1999 and uh it was concentrated in a few issues amc being uh, one of the big two gamestop being the other one uh, but we saw a 2850 percent gain in amc uh, from the start of 2021 to its peak in june just unfathomable uh, return in a short period of time uh, getting the attention of these meme stock traders and very little change in terms of fundamentals whatsoever the company was losing money back here it was losing money up here it's still losing money today <clears throat> very little change in terms of the actual fundamentals of the company but you can see the sentiment changed wildly and uh, they were trading at just unbelievably ridiculous multiple of sales uh, after this huge advance and today obviously much more reasonable after a 98 percent decline so what is the other side of the mania? The other side of the media is uh, what Ben Graham called the weighing machine. And the weighing machine is simply uh, that valuation eventually matters. So uh, that fundamentals eventually matters. And it may take a long time. In this case, it took a few years to get here. But uh, after that 98% decline, all of those gains and more have been erased. So a lot of lessons for investors to learn, but certainly one of the most important ones is don't chase, don't buy a stock based on a meme. And if you are lucky enough to catch some of this run up, don't assume that it's going to stay there. Uh, the, the notion of diamond hands, which was big back here, uh, these people were never going to sell. Well, that obviously wasn't the case. People sold uh, and uh, anyone who held on has, has uh, lost all of their profits and more. So. Uh, second lesson I would say is uh, coming back to that uh, central concept that I often talk about where not all risk is rewarded. So uh, AMC, obviously, unbelievably risky in terms of volatility over the past few years. Uh, but uh, were investors in the end rewarded for that volatility? No. So uh, if we look at the AMC versus the S&P 500, uh, had you purchased either one of them entering 2021, you would have been way ahead for obviously an AMC. But if we fast forward to today, s and is up very boring, 23% since the start of 2021. This is total returns, including dividend uh, and AMC stock down 41%. Now, I don't know where AMC is going to go in the future, but this is a lesson for any speculative individual stock, certainly one with this level of volatility. Uh, you're not guaranteed of anything. And certainly just because the fact uh, of the fact that it's volatile uh, doesn't mean uh, you're going to be rewarded for taking on that additional risk, that additional volatility. And this is just yet another reminder of that. So, so let's talk about the rental gap and what's going on in the rental market. And what we're seeing here is a divide in terms of suburban rent growth and urban rent growth. And what's driving that is really the trend of hybrid work and work from home really continuing longer than people I think anticipated. And so what we're seeing here is a chart of occupancy, office occupancy in 10 major US cities. And we're still below 50% of pre-pandemic levels in terms of uh, office occupancy. And so the fact that people have been able to work uh, more from home and they're able to live uh, away from the city more has led to more demand for housing in suburban areas. As a result, we've seen a gap kind of develop between uh, rental growth in terms of the price of rents in suburban areas versus urban areas. And if you look at July 2023, we're seeing uh, the biggest gap uh, that we've seen. Uh, and this is looking at cumulative difference in terms of, of rental growth uh, since March 2020. And now there's an 8% gap between uh, suburban rental gro growth versus urban. So suburban growth 8% higher uh, than urban growth. And what's driving that is the fact that uh, people are able to uh, work more from suburban areas, not be able to not have to come into the city as often. So even if they're coming in a few days a week, 
oh, they don't mind then having a longer commute. And where are the areas where we're seeing that bigger, biggest gap between um, rental growth in suburban and urban areas? Well, these are the cities that were highlighted in the report by apartment list. Portland being number one, 21% gap. Seattle, number two, 17%. Detroit, number three. A uh, lot of other cities on here as well. Most of the cities in their study uh, showed uh, rental growth in the suburbs outpacing uh, the cities uh, over the past few years. And will this continue? That's going to be uh, driven in large part by migration patterns and supply demand and, and whether people uh, start uh, coming back to the office, I think, and at a faster pace. But if we look at uh, housing supply, we're seeing a lot of building going on, not just in uh, uh, the suburbs, city as well. You're seeing a lot of multifamily housing. So uh, all of that should put a cap on, on rental growth rates uh, overall, and perhaps that'll change kind of this dynamic going forward as well. So I want to end with something positive, as we always do, and talking about food and talking about really extreme predictions of bad things that are going to happen in the future. Uh, this is one of the most prominent examples of that. Thomas Malthus, and he was an economist back in England in 1798, and he made this uh, prediction that population growth is going to outpace the growth in food supply, and that's going to lead to starvation. Uh, and uh, that's going to put a check on, on population growth, that population's weren't going to increase because people are essentially going to starve. Uh, and what his theory was is we're going to see exponential growth in terms of populations, uh, and we're going to see food production just continue at a linear rate. So he did not uh, anticipate uh, human beings being able to uh, account for this and come up with technological ways to uh, kind of match uh, this population growth. Uh, and uh, he said that we're going to have this point where there's a, a catastrophe became known as the Malthusian uh, catastrophe. Now, what happened in terms of population between 1798 and today, we saw an explosion and definitely exponential growth, 800 million back in 1798, 8 billion today. So more than a 10 X increase. And did we see that mass starvation play out? No, not at all. Uh, there's left, less people in poverty today, less people starving today as a percentage of population uh, than ever before. So certainly uh, not only did it not prevent, um, prevent population growth, a lack of food, the abundance of food actually helped um, population growth and obviously healthcare as well and other factors. But uh, the industrialization and technology and scientific revolutions led to advances uh, in um, agricultural um, output uh, that I think obviously uh, weren't being anticipated back then. And so just a few visuals on that front. Number one would be the agricultural land use uh, per person. We're doing more with less. We're uh, per person uh, in 2020, uh, we're using uh, 0.6 hectares per person. Hectares like I think two and a half acres. Uh, so 0 0.6 per person in 2020 and 1940 was uh, over one and a half. So this is, a, this is the estimate of the use uh, per person uh, needed uh, for agriculture. So uh, technology has allowed this, uh, allowed us to uh, produce way more, uh, way more crops, obviously way more food as the population is uh, way higher uh, uh, with uh, significantly less land. And if we look at in terms of, um, calories per person. So do we have enough food to feed everyone? Yes. Well, more than enough. We can see this uh, by looking at the calories per person from uh, all the way back, going back to 1270 uh, to 2018. This is in the United Kingdom who has the longest history of this data. And you could see uh, a trend upward and that really accelerated after uh, Malthus' uh, his prediction. And we're seeing the average calories uh, today, some would argue, too high, where we have the opposite uh, to his prediction, where we have an obesity uh, problem, not a starvation problem. So uh, obviously, great thing, uh, human ingenuity and grit and technology uh, has really counteracted uh, this negative prediction. So with that, we'll end it there. Have a great week, everyone. If you like the content, as always, subscribe to the channel, and I'll see you next time on The Week in Charts.